Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Each week, we hear real-time stories from athletes and CEOs on how to maximize performance through an endurance mindset. Let's get started. Today's guest has over 35 years of experience in the software industry. He has a passion for building high-performing global organizations that focus on blending the goals of the company with the goals of the individual. The author of an Amazon best-selling book, A Single Day in Peace, and a partner at BCG. Please welcome Steve D'Angelo and his great friend, Father Arnie. Welcome, gentlemen. Greg, how are you? Good to be Good. here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Steve, I'm going to start with you. We love talking about the endurance mindset here on this podcast. How has your endurance mindset impacted your life unexpectedly? Yeah, um, interesting question. So, you know, I, I often say, you know, I'm kind of blessed with that kind of perseverance attitude and, you know, endurance is part of perseverance. And, um, you know, I'd say for me, you know, and I'm sure for a lot of others, you know, your road to success or your road to meeting the goals you want to meet, it's not a straight line up, you know, it's a series of ups and downs and dealing with challenges, whether they're, you know, health challenges, family challenges, personal challenges, business challenges, and that mindset of endurance uh, certainly is a is a key requirement in being able to kind of see beyond the high that you may be on or the low that you may be on to try to keep it in 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 perspective humbly so you can keep charging forward. So, um, you know, as I think about some of the principles that I live by and I see that other successful people live by, certainly it stimulates that level of uh, mental strength or endurance, as you're calling it, to to keep charging forward. That's really helpful. Could you provide us an example of a time in your life that you were either on a super high and you needed to realize that the other side's coming or you were on a super low and you persevered through? Yeah, I can. Um, so um, in one case, I was a CRO for, uh, for a, a company. I'm giving you the super high and you know, we went from a business of five million in revenue to over 150 million in revenue, and we went public. And you know, it was a it was a super high, and you know, you feel great. You've built a company of a thousand or more employees, and and um, and everyone's doing well, and you're celebrating. You're serving clients well, um, and and you're feeling really good about yourself, and you're feeling really good about what you've achieved. But you also then have to say, okay, let's kind of keep this in perspective because, you know, again, it's the series of ups and downs. And then, you know, that same company, uh, as leadership started to change and board started to change, things changed and things started to get really sideways. And, um, you know, as things were going sideways and, you know, now you're a publicly traded company and you've got to meet your numbers each quarter. And fortunately, we continue to meet the numbers, but it was really, really challenging. And, you know, there are times where you say, wow, maybe it's time for me to move on. Right. But that endurance mindset of saying, okay, let me continue to see this through. And, uh, you know, again, no straight line up, ups and downs are all part of the journey. And when you have that mentality that, you know, the ups aren't the thing, the downs aren't the thing, it's the journey. So I would say that's an example of, of where I've experienced, you know, some, some strong up and then, you know, some, adversity and having to have that right mental attitude or right mental strength to keep it going. I get, I can relate to that for sure. Uh, Father Arnie, same question for you. How has an endurance mindset impacted your life unexpectedly? I think it's uh, impacted my life. It's a great question, by the way, Greg, and it, it, it takes in a whole um, layer. Like the, I, I use image of the onion, so many layers of this personal, emotional, physical, psychological, spiritual which very much is something we like doing also. But just some words that struck me in terms of answering your question. The first thing comes is commitment. If a commitment to a task or to a philosophy or to a way of life, that's, that's the starting point, I believe. It certainly has been for me. The measures in what I'm doing, the role I take on, the responsibilities I have, but that just doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's a lifelong process that you learn from from your birth and being a kid and going through school and the ups and downs that go along with that and teenage years and all the changes. And then I suppose end of teenage years, you're focusing on what really, really is something you want to do, whether it's the corporate world, 
whether it's it's the sporting achievement, whether it's it's some other aspect. Also, uh, what other, the word other struck me also was the word sacrifice. To which achieve commitment, you have to sacrifice something, and th that's again vast and varied, and that's for different people. For me, doing the role I'm doing, it's sacrificing, uh, falling in love, get married, and that's. <laughs> I mean, that's, well, that's very real for me. Um, fulfillment. And Steve and I have had a number of discussions about this. You know, am I fulfilled in what I'm doing, in the commitments that I do, in the role I do, and the sacrifices that come with that? And I think it's something, we mentioned the word humility um, before, and that, that comes from the Latin word humus, meaning grounded, earth, just know where you come from, that mom and dad really, really worked hard to, to make you the person that you are today. So they're just some of the, the thoughts that strike me for me. That's really insightful, Father. Um, I'd love to dig in a little bit deeper in the word sacrifice and with the people that you've worked with, the people that you are influencing, how have you seen their endurance mindset come to life through sacrifice? Well, first I see it with families. I've been privileged to work and journey with, with many, many families in 26 years. Of, of parish life, of school, and so on. And the sacrifices that mom and dad make to make life better for their, their kid. And I think, I think that that's the same for everybody. But also the sacrifices within a relationship itself. Now, I can't speak with any authority here, but I, I'm going to go on what I see. That, you know, the wife or the husband, they make sacrifices in order to make the commitment and the partnership and the marriage work. It just doesn't. And no book gives you the solutions. It doesn't give you the, the, the way with all it's, 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 it's a process. It's, it's again, multi-layered. It's relationship. It's, it's being together. It's accepting each other's, you know, weaknesses. It's the differences between each other. And yet for un some unexplainable reason, couples still meet in the middle. And then children see all this. In my view, my, my experience means children see it. But I'm not speaking of mixed experience itself, but the sacrifice is where I see that coming in. That's really insightful. Stephen, any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you for asking. Yeah, quite a few. So if you think about sacrifice and you think about the role of an executive of any company, and when I say executive, senior level manager, you could be a marketing executive, sales, engineering, finance, a CEO, there is a significant sacrifice that you make in 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 your life i've often said having an executive role is like having a second family right because you've got your 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 family family and then you've got your business family and that business family all the employees they look to you to kind of be their guiding light they look to you to challenge them they look to you to mentor them they look to you to listen to them and it's all consuming and one of the things Father Arnie and I are seeing is that this sacrifice, a la stress, is, is having a major toll on executives. And, and, and what we're seeing more and more is that executives, executive teams are working together and executives are working with their company to help the emotional side, the emotional health of their employees, emotional health of their, of their executive team. Not that they're not going to charge hard, not that they don't want to achieve big goals and have lots of sacrifice, but while you're doing it, how do you balance that with emotional health so people can A, stay positive, can stay physically healthy so they can continue to be productive? So the, the price that one pays around sacrifice is quite great. And then obviously from a family perspective, you need a supportive family as you're going through your executive journey that they understand. And that's not always easy. There's always challenges on the family side. And now you, as an executive, you got to balance. Am I going to get that next plane ride home because you know my wife or my husband need me? Or am I going to see this next board meeting through, right? Those challenges really put stress on people. So I, I connect this sacrifice with, you know, unfortunately, it's stressful. It's absolutely stressful. Um, as an entrepreneur and the husband of a COO, I see it on both sides for sure. Steve, I'd love to know, when did you start seeing companies start shifting towards this emotional health and support? I, I began observing 
the senior executives and the very unique things that they did for their own emotional support, I'd say 15, 20 years ago, which was kind of the the beginning of me writing the book, A Single Day of Peace, because it's basically the principles that happy and successful people follow versus successful people who aren't really happy. And I was documenting them more and more as I was experiencing it with executives. But then as as they went public with it, what I think it's been about five years now, five, five or six years, I started to see the executive team being more public about it, talking more about a healthy culture, talking more about the the kinds of things that they need to kind of have in their mind in order to be successful, bringing people like Father Arnie and I in to talk to the executives from a spiritual perspective, how important is spirituality in your life, whatever that may be to you. Uh, from and then for the area of of you know what are the critical components in your life that you need to balance and that ability to get people to reflect on that and then openly communicate and be vulnerable that we have seen to be some very interesting things. So I'd say five six years has become I'll call it a more of a public conversation. And we'll dig into that in a few minutes, Father Arnie. Um, how did you and Steve meet? Where did this uh, relationship we- start? We we met um, through a mutual friend of ours uh, in New Jersey uh, two summers ago, and we went for a beautiful, wonderful game of golf, and the rest is history. We went from there. Yeah. Very simple. And yeah. that, that's awesome. Um, so go into a little bit deeper of what Steve was talking about with how you two work with teams, Father Ani. I'd love to hear more about that. Well, I mean, I, I, I see the value of this and, and the importance of this. And S- Steve refers to his journey last 20 years and five years in particular. I, I would have seen the journey last 26, um, if I could, if I could use that example for the simple reason, because the, the world is changing so fast. I, I mean, today's technological item is tomorrow's obsolete. And that's the reality of the world. And I would have seen it, um, from, from the broader range where you know, visiting homes and meeting people in different aspects of, of, of the pastor life, people who are quite wealthy, people who live very simple, modest lives, and the in-betweeners, if I could use that phrase. And the same challenges are the same for everyone. But because, because you're rich or because you're finding things difficult financially, the challenges are still the same. Children, work, spirituality, uh, you know, what the philosophical questions I know Steve I knows I tap into this often. Like, what is my life? Where is it going? What gives me focus? What gives me fulfillment in that life? So I would have seen it for over 20 years. And the world is is getting faster and faster and faster. And the question is, am I expected to keep up with those changes? Or is there a point when I say, you know something, just stop for a moment. Just let's just take some stock and see where I am within myself. Because I think a fulfilled person within is a person who is very productive in what they do, be it family, be it work, be it the corporate world, and so on. So diving into that a little bit deeper, let's say we have an audience member who feels unfocused or unfulfilled because they are chasing the times and chasing technology and looking at the new thing. And it's just, as you mentioned, it's never ending. How do you help somebody get more grounded? I, I, yeah, I, I, I'll have a go first, Steve, maybe. Um, I think it's, it's sometimes we look for, for answers in books and, and there's wonderful, wonderful books out there and, and suggestions and so on and theses and essays. But I, I, I often say simplicity is key. So my question to the good person would be, you know, how is your life? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, are you happy? You know, and as they reveal the story, they're revealing themselves. So then, you know, if to say, well, you know, these are the challenges I have or whatever it is, what well, I think to understand where someone is right now, you've got to understand their story. Mm. Well said, Steve, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So what Father and Arnie have, and I have put together, um, and this is something we're just launching now, um, is around working with executive teams around this concept and what are the buckets of of kind of um, topics that we should cover that will address the sacrifice, the stress, am I really being fulfilled? And, and we've 
we did design four specific themes. When you think about the challenges that people are facing, they often fall within these four. Um, and then, of course, there's multiple levels under it, but the family. Let's dig in to understand how are things going on with your family. I mean, most recently, I sat down with an executive, very successful a gentleman that has a $2 billion privately held company. And um, we were talking about these topics and we got into family and he has stress within the family. He's trying to find ways to bridge some gaps in his family. So I bring up that example as this is something that we see often. So what's going on in your family? How is that impacting your life, your stress, and, and, and your emotional health? Next area, financial. You know, you could be extremely financially successful, but there are still financial things that are going on in your life that cause stress. Then it's the goals is the third component. What goals are you pursuing? And then as you dig down to understand why you're pursuing those goals, you really come to learn whether or not they are going to make you be fulfilled. And when you achieve a goal, how do you recognize within yourself something positive versus I worked really hard to get here, achieve the goal. Ah, it wasn't that great. I got to go do the next thing. And then I got to do the next thing. Don't get into that rat race. So we talk about that with goals. And the final component is around this idea of change. Change drives everybody crazy. Human beings usually do not like change. And when change enters your life, whether it be a change in role, a change in family, a change of company, that adds stress, that adds, adds a dynamic to hinder your emotional health. So we talk through those kinds of things. And then actually we start digging deeper into topics like, all right, let's talk about your spirituality. Let's talk about your family harmony. Let's talk about how you're taking care of yourself physically. I mean, all of these are components that fall within those four buckets. And when you get executives, when you get employees to start talking about those things, they open up greatly and there's a sense of relief that they can get this off their minds and off their chest. And the ultimate objective is then that once this is all covered and it's all spoken about and we put a game plan together how to address it, the company becomes more effective because now the executive, the CEO has got a much more healthier, emotionally healthier executive team and they can perform better. So a lot there that I shared to your question, but that's kind of how we see it. And as we're launching this in order to, to help companies just you know be more healthier as individuals so they can be more productive. That's really powerful. Um, and thank you for doing that work because it is absolutely needed. Steve, what came to mind when you were saying that was vulnerability? How do you work with an executive, a CEO? You know, they've got to that position through running through brick walls, being the fastest, being the right place at the right time, and being vulnerable is difficult. How do you work with that executive to become more vulnerable? Some executives get there very quickly because they're secure, they have self-confidence, they realize they don't always have to be right, right? So they just have this natural humility or just understanding that I don't have to have all the answers, so they're willing to be more open. Other end of the spectrum, you're absolutely right. I've dealt with executives in my consulting for VC firms, consulting for PE firms, you know, their portfolio companies. Some companies are very early stage technology companies. And, you know, those CEOs don't want to be vulnerable. They don't want to be transparent. They see that as a sign of weakness. And I'll give you an example. Case in point, I'm right now working with a founder CEO of an early stage company that raised a significant amount of money that is burning through money and there's an anger that this CEO founder has that he's not getting more funds just because he's asking for it to come on in. And there's this anger and there's this pushback that I'm not being trusted. And and I have to get him to kind of kind of calm a bit, which I'm, I'm starting to I'm starting to succeed to calm a bit and look within yourself and say, what is it about me that I have to change? And I have to be open with my investors to say, I made a few mistakes here, right? Some people get there quickly. Some people, it takes a long time. But I think through the right prodding and the right questioning, getting them to understand they win more by being vulnerable, they ultimately get there. That's well said. Father Arnie, what comes to mind when I say the word vulnerability? Vulnerability is is um, can be seen by some as weakness. It can be seen by some as opportunity. Um, 
I, I suppose it's it's it depends also on your circumstances. We 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 some people can be vulnerable and feel comfortable being vulnerable in certain uh, fora. Others can't. They 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 have a name to uphold. They have a target to reach, and so on. So, if if I could just gently for a moment, you know, speak from a, a the the personal point of view is knowing where I'm vulnerable and what are my needs. That and that that's mm-hmm. that's personal. It's a broader. Whereas. I suppose I'm guessing now, and I don't have the experience of this, that Steve has, you know, if you're living in the fast day in corporate America and you're driving yourself, you're going to hit a wall at some point and something is going to break. So I suppose what strikes me is no matter what, what stage of life you're in, there comes a point where say you go into your boss or go into your colleague and say, I can't do this anymore. You know, I'm not able to, I'm done, I'm burnt. And this is where burnout comes in. So there's, I, I think vulnerability is, it, it can be a very healthy thing, but I think be, it's being vulnerable in the right circumstances brings in sense of trust and so on, but being vulnerable also in, in other situations can also be damaging, depends on, on the role in particular. But I mean, vulnerability is part of who we are. We, we can't avoid it, but is there a mask or do we let go of the mask? I love the way you said that. I'm going to shift gears on you slightly, Father Arnie. And talk about spirituality. Do you have, I'm sure you've got hundreds, but what's your favorite story of somebody that you've worked with when they've discovered their spirituality, regardless of how they define it? But I suspect there's hundreds and hundreds of people that you've touched and been involved with that you've seen a pivot or a change. And I'd love to hear one of those stories. It, it was, I drew many, many stories, Greg. I suppose what comes to mind immediately was a very sad situation I had um, not so long ago where there was a tragedy in a family and lost their child. Um, now, I, I went through the same kind of health issue a pre- couple of years previous to that. And I remember the, the parents asked me when I went to visit them uh, because the, the faith was, was, was being challenged and their spirituality was being challenged. And, and they weren't sure. That's understandable. That's what happens when bad luck comes your way. You do question God or you do question a divine or someone who is up there. That's, that's a natural human thing to do. And the question I was asked was, what's, I, I actually happened to be in a coma because of my sickness. And this kid was also in a coma. But the mom asked me a question. She says, you know, I'm struggling at the moment, but I know she says you have to answer for me. I said, what's it like to be in a coma? Now, but what does one say? And my answer to her was very simple. I said, listen, I've no recollection of it, but I do know there was no pain. And she says, that's eased my mind. That's, that's gave me the sense of, of a little bit of, of, I suppose, calmness within her at that moment. Now, I saw that as a spiritual moment because you mentioned spirituality, Greg, and, and it's, it's a very broad, I suppose, a narrative. Um, Specifically, what I do as a Roman Catholic priest, and, and in terms of, of trying to break down a Bible narrative to people's lives and trying to connect it. But Christ was able to connect with people's vulnerability and the sacrifices. And he was, he was I, I would hold, he was certainly the best, if, certainly one of the best of the communicators extraordinaire. So I think that's where my spirituality helps. Again, on a broader level, it's every weekend when I'm preaching or up in something, I would have someone in and come and say to me afterwards that, God, I didn't see it that way before. Or, you know, God, what you said today meant something to me. I may not know their story, but something I might say would connect with them. So connection there is very important. And certainly, as Steve outlined earlier, those four goals that were kind of, I suppose, are the four pillars we anchor things on. Family, the goals of financial and the change. So teeing off that, uh, Steve, Father Arnie just talked about having impact on people in an unexpected way, right? He's given a, a sermon and somebody hears it differently than it's been spoken, but it has an impact. Have you seen that in your life with executive teams that you've run or been a part of where, you know, you have an impact on an individual in a different way than you expected, but it was a positive and I'll just stop hmm. there and let you take that from whichever direction you want to take it. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. And I would say that, first off, probably the most fulfilling part 
for me anyway, in my business life is the impact that I have seen that I have uh, had on others. Uh, I'll give you one example and I'll get into a little bit more detail. Just yesterday, I had a phone call with a gentleman that is with a major technology firm. I was talking with him when he was a sales guy struggling. He didn't never worked for me, but I mentored him and helped him put a path together to become a sales leader, sales manager, sales director. He followed that path. He just came back from his sales kickoff uh, meeting in Vegas, and he was awarded the sales leader of the of the of the year award. And he said, you know, he called me to say the things you helped me do along the way helped me get there. And that's just one example of that feeling you have is okay. I positively have touched someone's life, their their career. But I will tell you that as a leader, and I try to tie these things into the consulting that I do because whether I'm hired to help somebody redefine their sales organization or re-engineer how they go to market, it always comes back to someone is being challenged emotionally and they're stressed and we get into these topics. And I would say that the spirituality side often come often comes out. Um, I will tell you that as I work with people and I help them in the business world to be more successful, there becomes this trust. There is becomes this, whether I'm helping them with something in their family life or uh, they come to me and say, you know, I've got this challenge with my wife or I've got this challenge with my friend. They trust me enough because they know I care about them more than the numbers that's on their head. Mm-hmm. And this is part of culture components that I often roll out. One of the culture components is caring, right? And I to help sales leaders understand, you know, if all you care about is their number and their performance, they feel it and you're not going to get the most out of them. But if you care about them truly, where candidly, even if it's better for you to call someone in your network and move them from your company to their company, because they'll be better off, you ought to do that. So when you give caring, people come to you and say, you know, I got something I want to talk to you about. And it could be outside of business. And I see it often. And I find the time to ask them, what's your level of spirituality? And some people say, well, I'm very spiritual, very belief. So I ask them, well, whatever your beliefs are, you know, lean on that. You know, lean on that to help you get through whatever it is you're feeling. And those that are not, uh, I often talk to executives and I ask them about spirituality and I say, well, I'm not spiritual at all. You know, I don't even know if I believe in God. I don't know. And I say, well, you know, I've seen you do some spiritual things. You have this habit of meditating or you have a fund that you contribute to that's a charitable fund. I mean, those are spiritual kinds of things. And they then say, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I've got some more spirituality in me. So I try to tie my business advice when they come to me and they trust me and they have these problems, it comes into their personal life and tie some level of spirituality without invading. You know, I want to be careful not to invade certain areas. Uh, but if the opening is there, we have that dialogue. And it's a very important dialogue. Steve, I'm going to switch gears on you slightly. Um, you published a book. Did you thought you're going to be a published author at some point in your life or give us that journey? When did you realize that you had a book inside you that needed to come out? Yeah. Okay. So there were two things that um, nudged me to write this book. Uh, And I've talked to Father Arnie about this. I consider myself a rebel Catholic uh, in that I do believe that the Catholic Church is fantastic. I think it's too rules-based. It doesn't doesn't address the youth as much as it should. And Arnie and I have had good dialogue about this. So this always gnawed at me. Uh, And, you know, I went to church a lot, but it gnawed at me. On the other side, the second piece, it was that I worked alongside these business executives that were very successful, happy, some of them billionaires. And they were very happy with their life. And I also worked alongside very successful, some billionaires, professional athletes that were miserable and they did things differently. And I, I was kind of a student of success. So I would just document the things I saw the successful people do. So I had this inventory of principles that the happy, successful people did And I said, you know, I need to author these. Now, this was eight years ago. I have to author these. But I don't want to do it in just a way in which I kind of give an instruction manual. So I took this idea of spirituality and a business executive turned Catholic priest to bring his leadership principles to the Catholic Church to help kind of reinvigorate the Catholic Church. So I had this crazy idea of that. I wrote the story, tied it together with the principles, and lo and behold, it turned out quite well. And and that and that's kind of how it all happened. So it, it's a book that it's an inspirational novel. So it's a fictitious story. And I think I took a page. I don't know if you know the name Agmandino. 
Ogmandino is a very popular author. He wrote lots of success books, all tied around spirituality and all tied around fictitious stories. It's very intriguing. So I took a page out of his book and followed that in, in writing the book. So Father Arnie, when a friend comes to you and asks you about a single day of peace, what do you tell them about the, how, how do you describe the book? The book is, is, is very inspirational. It's very real, very personal. It's, it's also the story, as Steve said, about a priest who is trying to be a leader and sometimes maybe rebelling against the system at times. And that happens. We, we all do. We all rebel against the system, whether it's priesthood, whether it's the corporate world, whether it's, you know, because if, if, if we don't, we're mere functionaries and mere machines. So it was, it was, I found a very compelling story of that journey. And if I can recall, Steve, at the end, he, it was, it was, he was being disillusioned really with, with the whole system. That was, that was what I, t I took from the book. Right. I was, I mean, I, I've never come across a book like that before. And I was surprised that Steve had given me a copy of it after our game of golf. Mm -hmm. When I, I read this and, uh, you know, I just read it and I found it very interesting. It said compelling, but centered around this particular priest and the challenges of, 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 of being a leader. And, and I think that that's, that's really the springboard of where we're coming from. You know, Steve's book and our own experiences of life. And this is where we've identified the pillars and where we're, you know, offering ourselves yeah. to help others. We see ourselves as helping others. And, and it's interesting, while I use the Catholic Church as the foundation, as people have read it, I've had so many people that I don't know reach out to me and say, hey, I'm Hindu. And I felt the same way in my religion. Hey, I'm Jewish. I felt the same way in my religion. I had a gentleman who was Jewish and his mother went through the Holocaust and is, survived and is still alive and said that I read this book and the things that are in here, I didn't know it at the time, but it helped me get through the pain I was dealing with through my Holocaust experience. So while I used, again, the Catholic Church as the, as the part of the story, it applies to any institutional belief, right? Let's get away just from you got to do it this way and that way. Otherwise, you won't go to heaven, so to speak. So let's be more spiritual. Isn't that amazing? It kind of goes back to a previous question of how when you're telling a story, people listen to it and read it differently. And they apply certain parts of that story to certain parts of their life, which goes to how important it is for us to be storytelling because communicating those messages and the spirituality and what we do is one of the reasons I'm doing these podcasts, right? I want this endurance mindset conversation to expand. Um, Steve, let's talk about the work that the, the ideal client, the two of you are looking to work with. Um, maybe there's an audience member out there who's thinking about they need to apply these principles into their business. Help us uh, better understand how you work together. Yeah, thank you. So um, ideal client, if I were to think about, uh, you know, our preferred prospect profile, if you will, like we all do when we're building a business. Hey, who am I going after? Who's my target market? For us, it's less about size of company, less about what industry you're in, less about how, uh, you know, revenue or number of employees. It is more about the company that recognizes that emotional health is very important to the success of the business while you still charge hard. I am a big believer that in business, one of the goals is winning, right? And sometimes in today's day day and age, we get too wrapped up in the in the culture of hey, free ice cream, free food, and and employees kind of lose perspective. We're here to win. You got to work hard. You got to sacrifice. We have to win. However, if we address the emotional well being of the people, they will perform much better. So it is it is the executives, the leadership that see the emotional well being as important. And candidly have a level of spirituality and recognize that, hey, I'm not going to invade my people with my spiritual beliefs, but I'm going to encourage them to find their own because as they find their own, they're going to be a more fulfilled person. And when they're a more fulfilled person, then they're going to perform better because, you know, it's somewhat selfish. If I, if I help Greg be healthier, happier, more vulnerable, he's going to perform better for me. So it's, it's those executives, those CEOs that are looking for that. Uh, whether it be annual kickoff meetings, whether it be, you know, a retreat that you take your executives on, whether it be a one day management meeting or family offices, you know, as we know, family offices very often have retreats for their families. They cover various kinds of topics. 
we believe that our our conversational topic here could be could be well accepted by by that group as well. Are you also considering doing workshops for groups of CEOs? That's a great point. Yes. So as we see this, we see really three components of how we could deliver this. Some companies are going to be, hey, I want a one or two hour Zoom meeting where you guys broach these topics with our with our people because they're all over the place. Then there's another example where, hey, we'll give you a a one day or half day in our office, everybody together at our at our CEO summit. Another will be, hey, a three day workshop. We want to really get deep. So I would agree that yes. Doing this with a group of CEOs, with CEOs that have their own kind of groups, their their kickoff meetings or their you know their retreats as a group of CEOs in the CEO CEO um, com, uh, communities that exist, right? We could certainly participate there. Fantastic. So, Father Arnie, an audience member wants to get in touch with you. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, have my email, but I, I, at the moment, I would imagine it's too steep because I, I, I mean, he's got my all my details. And I, I think that's probably the better central axis at the moment, given I'm in, in one part of, of the Atlantic and he's on the other side of it. And what I just want to co- you know, I can come back for a moment to what Steve was saying there, who explained it brilliantly. And what struck me as he was speaking was, you know, everyone wants to be fulfilled. And it's not possible to achieve total fulfillment, in, in my humble opinion. But a fulfilled person who is very much aware of where they're going in life and that sense of fulfillment, the goals, as Steve explained there very brilliantly, will come naturally. It, it's, it, it's not something that, you know, they want to show off to a boss or a CEO. It just be natural. And it, it'll, it'll seep through the company. People will see it. We're a happy person, fulfilled. People see it. So Steve is my details. And um, that's the best way of getting me. Wonderful. Yeah, and you're so right. In fact, I've noticed over these last three or four days, I've had this fulfillment level in me that has increased. I don't know why. I don't know if it's the weather. I don't know if it's my podcasting, but I, I sense it for some reason. Steve, how can an audience member get in touch with you? Sure. Several ways. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, Stephen D'Angelo. Uh, look me up there. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Send me a message there. Uh, you can email me. My book title is A Single Day of Peace. And if you email me at single day of peace at gmail.com it comes right to me you can get me there um those are probably the best ways you can visit my website leave a message there at a single day of peace.com and um i'm happy to reach back out to anybody that wants to have a conversation whether about topics we talked about here or some of the uh the summit things that we're going to do father arnie and i whatever whatever's on someone's mind i'm happy to have a collaboration well, I have to, and we'll include those details in our show notes for sure. And I need to thank both of you gentlemen for the work that you're doing around emotional health in the corporate life, in personal life. It's it's becoming more and more important. I see it in my children. I see it in my family. I see it in my businesses. Thank you for spending the time with us today. For our audience members who got some value out of today, please share this episode. Please like it and subscribe. We want this message to be spread out as wide as possible. Gentlemen, again, thank you for your time. Greg, thank you. Much appreciated. Thank thank you, Greg. Grateful. Thank you for tuning in to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. To hear more inspiring stories and strategies around the endurance mindset, be sure to subscribe below or visit us at chiefenduranceofficer.com. Until next time, keep pushing those limits.